to be Avalon in Hollywood. It's a privilege to be here tonight uh, to celebrate the life of this extraordinary woman that I'm just so touched by, by uh, her soul and uh, her spirit. And then her story just blew me away. She represents a generation perhaps our greatest generation of Cubans. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the members of Angele Alvarez's orchestra. star of tonight's show singing her own songs, the extraordinary talented and the sublimely beautiful Mrs. Angela Alvarez. Angela Alvarez is just weeks away from her first professional concert in Hollywood. At the age of 90, she has waited her whole life for a chance to perform her songs. I, I like to move that what I feel so, so well because uh, you see how I walk. I don't walk like a, like a old lady like this. I walk like this. <laughs> I dance with it with a broom and then I make I put the broom like this and I make exercise. <laughs> exercise like this. <laughs> that I composed, that I pass on. This one is an old, old book, and then all, all the song when I wrote a long time ago, August 8, 62. Yes. This one's very old. Yeah, they are very old. I think that music is the language of the soul. 
Yes. Lo mucho que te quiero y pienso que yo muero si no te vuelvo a ver. Quiero tenerte cerquita de mi alma. Quiero estrecharte y volverte a acariciar. This remarkable journey begins many years ago on the island of Cuba. The largest and most important island of the West Indies is Cuba. Strikingly picturesque, metropolis of three quarters of a million people, Havana is a blend of the cosmopolitan and the native, the ancient and the modern. I grew in a little town in Cuba and my my life when I was a little girl in Cuba was very beautiful. I was a very, very happy girl. My grandfather and my grandmother, my mother parent, he died a hundred ten and she died a hundred five. And they are they have sixteen children. My father have a big farm in a town close to 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 Elia that there was the name of the sugar mill where I was living. Sugar is king. It is the heart of the island's economic life. I I love the United States when I was a little girl. At that time we don't have TV, but I hear in a station a radio station about in New York about everything United States. Glenn Williams, I like him. You are a little girl, you learn very easy any language. And then I like to say, pardon me boy, the time I knew it, you, you. I didn't know what I say, but I sing all the song in English. <laughs> I started to learn to play piano when I was eight years old. But when they put me in the private school, it was a, a person who come to teach guitar. And then I, I wrote a letter to my father. I wanted, I wanted to learn to play guitar. And then he say, okay. And then that's why I start to sing. I have about 15 years old and I say, went to, to my father, may I sing a song with the mariachi? And then she say, oh, he said, okay. And then I talk with the mariachi, I sing the song. And then the mariachi say, wow, I like that you sing for loving our mariachi. <laughs> then I, I feel that I could be famous, but my father say, no, no. <laughs> well, I remember she was always on the guitar. She was always any gathering with any, didn't matter how many family members were there. So my earliest memories of my grandmother would be her on the guitar and just cranking out a tune. <laughs> at a restaurant and there was a piano or a guitar, somehow she made herself up on that stage. All the time when I see opportunity to missing, I have fun and I talk with everybody. <laughs> My father one day told me that he wanted to talk to me. He asked me, well, now is the time that you are going to be to the university. May I have an idea of what you have in your mind to do? Oh, yes, I want to tell you that I want to be a singer, a star. Oh, my daughter, no, I like hear you to sing. I love you so much. No, I don't want that for my daughter. I love him very much. And then I keep that in my mind and in my, in my heart. And I tried to forget about it, but always was sing in me, yes. She was a wonderful mother and a wonderful wife and a wonderful grandmother. Um, 
but this underlining tone where this dream that was just on the back burner. It was always during family gatherings that we would, you know, after dinner or a lot of time when, when the family was together on, on holidays. Uh, she just she just wanted to entertain after every meal or whenever she was there. So I, it's just this collage of of memories that I have of her just always playing. I don't know. I just had some kind of an epiphany where I called her and I said, I said, Nana, I'm gonna fly out to Baton Rouge and. Uh, and I want you to uh, sing every song that you've ever written for me. I want, I want to hear them all and I want to hear what they're about and just so that we can have them in the family. You know, I'm going to stick a microphone in front of you and I just want you to play your songs. Now that I have these recordings, I can become more familiar with the songs. And even when we were recording them in our house, I just remember I kept having this reaction to how incredible the melodies of her songs were. It was almost like we had heard them before, but they had never existed anywhere. Well, I composed a song in Cuba, living a half 14 or 15 years old. And at that age, we dream a lot. And it was a, 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 a guy that I, he was my friend, and, I, and then I like him. But he don't pay attention to me. I write a song about how beautiful is love. So tell us who that boy was. He, well, he was my husband. And I composed a lot of songs thinking of him, yes. Tengo tu amor, ya nada me importa. Así, así me siento feliz. Now that these songs have been discovered and you see the writing, you see the emotion, you see all that was in there, you see how it was her coping mechanism, during those times, she just expressed herself through song, through composition, and it's just beautiful. My husband, Orlando, he come to LSU, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he grabbed a mechanic engineer to work in sugar industry. When he come back with the degree, if he told me one day he won, talk with my father, because you want to marry me? And this is a very special and unusual thing, you know. She, these songs, you know, mark moments in her life. <laughs> The company, when we married, they give us a house because that the, they was the style in, in the sugar mill. And then I have four children, Jose, Maria, Orlando, and Gerardo. I was very, very, very happy with my, my children. And it was a very happy life that I have at that time in Cuba. I remember they all lived in a little town uh, in Cuba called Waimaro. My mother had, had had my sister, my third brother, Orlando, and my young brother, Jerry, or Gerardo. Actually, they have a farm too, so, so we go there you know, too and, and you know, play with the horses, cows. And, they all have all animals, chickens. But it was a happy life. It was, it was. I remember uh, the first memory of her singing, uh, she would give my brother Jerry and myself, and he would sing a lullaby that involved a race. 
and then you know my horse would be winning and then Jerry would start complaining and then she would change the song on the fly where Jerry's horse would be winning. <laughs> This is me in Baradero, Cuba, with my children. It was a beautiful, a beautiful beach. This is a good memory. When we was living in that sugar mill, Jose comes from the school very happy. Marucha take piano class, and Orlando, Orlando like to, to help the man who clean in the, the yard, and, and Bobby all the time he asking for food because he like food. <laughs> yes, very happy. But totally Fidel took the country. Exile revolutionary Fidel Castro landed in Cuba in 1956 in an attempt to overthrow the corrupt government of Fulgencio Batista. I was a boarding school, so we, you know, we uh, we lived in a big dorm with about a hundred people, hundred kids. One of the Jesuit brothers, uh, uh, during lunch, said to us, uh, uh, "I remember this very vividly because it was uh, it was really uh, uh, quite revealing at that point." He says, uh, "I, I want to show you a film, and um, I want to show you a film that that you cannot talk to anybody about." And I said, well, what is it? Said, well, we'll see it. So we went into, well, there was a classroom where they had a projector. And uh, he, uh, he, he showed us a film uh, about communism. And then he said, uh, at that point, he said, He said at that point, uh, this is what's going to happen. One night, we, uh, the town was attacked. Uh, my father kind of sensed that this was going to happen. I guess he got he got word that they were going to have a, lot, uh, a big push into the town to try to drive out the, uh, the Batista forces. I remember right at sunset, the first shot went out. There was gunfire. Uh, the, that was sort of one of the earliest strongholds of Batista that Fidel was able to take because it was right at the foothills where he was. And they would fight at night, and my father would get us all together, put us in like the bathtub, and put a mattress over everybody. Our house was the farthest away from the Batista Army barracks. So because of that, I think that's where they, they established uh, their control center there. Now I could hear throughout the night them talking and uh, instructions and what have you on a walkie-talkie. And... Going to school the next day, seeing the shells, the bazooka shells, and stuff like that on the, on the, uh, on the street. I remember uh, seeing the bullet holes in the, in the houses. The concern now was, uh, well, uh, you know, it's, uh, this, uh, this was gonna happen again. Uh, it was just a matter of time before, before uh, they came back. And so for safety, my father then uh, made arrangements to fly us out on, the only thing that was coming in and out was the mail by air. And it was one of those single prop planes. We flew out one morning and we, we didn't take anything with us. It was just uh, what we were wearing at the point because it was very quick. So we flew to Havana. We stayed in Havana and I started listening to the radio. And then all of a sudden the, 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 the announcement comes out that Batista has left. And uh, so I run in and I said, my father, Batista has left. And I said, be quiet, you're gonna get, in get us in trouble here. <laughs> you know, because uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of hush hush uh, back in those days. Join us followers of 
Fidel Castro sweep triumphantly through the Cuban capital hours after their rebellion had toppled the regime of Fulgencio Batista. It was chaotic after that. I mean, the, the streets were full of people firing shots and it was just normal, the normal citizenship went onto the streets and, uh, and it was uh, celebrations and Castro drove in. He came in with a tank and the troops and what have you. He had a parade uh, going down the, uh, the Malecon and we were on the third floor looking at it. So I was very close. At first he promises free elections. He acknowledges many of the traditional rights of citizens and the established institutions of government. But the elections never take place and the government quickly becomes an instrument of coercion. Batista left and Fidel took the power and everything was changed. Fidel Castro's new regime wasted no time in making radical changes to the country. In the school where my children was, they put new people to teach them, and one day my children come to say they, they have a new teacher. They don't like her, what she teach that day. And she started to teach the children about socialism. The teacher said, well, children, do you, you believe in God? Yes. If you believe in God, because God is good, close your eye and ask a candy for him. And repeat with me, God, because you are good, put a candy in my desk. Open your eye, no candy. Now, ask Fidel. Fidel loves Cuba. Fidel loves you. Fidel loves the revolution and then close your eye and say, Fidel, because you love me, you love my parents, and you are good, put a candy in my deck. Open your eye, candy was there. I wasn't going to school. My father didn't want me to go to school because the school became sort of a, uh, the way to, to indoctrinate uh, kids. So he says, you're not going to school, you're gonna stay away from the schools. I do remember that there was a dirt road that you could see from the house, maybe about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile, and we would always be cognizant that if there was a car coming, that there would be someone we knew, because we were afraid that they would come and ask about, why aren't you at school? I was thinking, why that happened in Cuba, that they have a, a change, you know, and then I, I was thinking, I, I would like to break that. But, and then I have the inclination to sing about that. Most of the time when I compose a song, the inspiration comes to my mind, or something happened in my life that touched me very deep. With just 15 days before her concert, Angela and Carlos begin rehearsing songs at her home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Vamos una vez más de ahí, ok. Bueno, vamos a seguir a romper el yugo. ¿Te sientes bien con esa? Sí. Okay. I have a grand son that is the son of Jose, my other son. And Carlos, he went to Boston and made the, the master in music. And I feel very proud of him. Yeah. We have a lot of connection because we understand very well together because they love music and I love music. The thing about Cuban music is it really is a fusion of, of European tradition mixed and fused with this African tradition. So, so much of what Cuban makes Cuban music sound the way it does it are those two worlds coming together. Ahora, si yo pudiera. Yo pudiera romper el yugo que te aprisiona con gran poder. Feliz sería, yo cantaría himno de paz. Bring in the rhythm section as we go here. The bass is always really, really, really important in Cuban music. 
the, the rhythm she picked and the style she picked, there's just, there's nothing more Cuban. Whenever she talks about this song, she talks about, she wishes there was a way to calm the anger and the hate. Along with drastic social, political, and economic changes, rumors were rife of children being taken away to be raised by the state. All the laws start to change. And Fidel make a law that he, he send your children to Russia for two years when they are under 18. When President Kennedy hear that, he opened the door for Cuban people send the children to the United States. It became obvious that we want to leave. Life changed a lot when we need to make the decision that we have to leave Cuba. Then the process of trying to get out, I believe, began. And uh, when you made known to the government that you were going to leave, they would come and do an inventory of your possessions to make sure that when you left Cuba, all those possessions were still there. And then uh, once you have done everything, you have to go back uh, and wait for the announcement of your leave. And that happened uh, in 1962. I remember being at the farm and my father said, we got to go to Havana, we're leaving. He wasn't leaving, he was gonna stay. At that point, he was he was working for the Castro government. What Castro did is, uh, with the sugar mill uh, industry is that he turned it into regional productions. Breasted earth, breasted sugar cane. United States bought the huge sugar cane crop, that is, when Cuba was good and obedient. But on the state farms, they are harvesting without worries. You are not fine because we are no longer a good little Cuba. It doesn't matter. Others will buy. Yeah, no choice but to, uh, to really work for him at that point in time. Uh, you couldn't reveal your hand that you were leaving. You, you could, uh, the fact that we were leaving, it was okay, but the fact that he was not applying to leave Cuba, he never did apply then that was uh, that was uh, okay you know he was uh, he was safe this is my husband and me when we take that picture is when we made the decision that I have to go to the United States with my four children and I told him that I want to go to a studio to make a picture with him because when I left Cuba he stayed in Cuba and then I go to the United States and I, I told him, I want to keep a memory of that moment because I don't know we are going to see each other. They send you a telegram the day that is your flight. I went to the airport with my fortune. Well, the plan was, and they were all at the airport, my grandmother and all of the children, and they did understand that they would never come back to Cuba. It just wasn't an option. It wasn't a vacation. It was the end. All They all had like four pairs of underwear, three pairs of pants, five shirts, whatever they could carry with them because that was it. They weren't allowed to carry too much out of Cuba. Their poor was very uh, sad in a way because we knew that our, our dad wasn't coming. Me so young, I didn't know really what was going on, but. I knew it wasn't right because when we were living our, our, our own our home. What you remember about that day? Uh, that's gonna be tough to uh, This is uh, difficult because <laughs> I don't know if this is possible. 
that, that, that was when we got separated, you know, and I think, uh, I think a lot of that j junk in my life, you know, in terms of how things changed, I can trace it back to that moment. We left on May 23rd, 1962, I'll never forget the day. When we were checking, the man who checked said, for the, f for the five passenger, one can go. And then I said, who is that? Angela Alvarez. That's me? Why I didn't go? Why I can't go? Because I fixed all my paper in the same place with my children. Well, listen, don't make any question to us. We always are right. If I say you can go, that's it. Don't ask me any question. I mean, at the last moment before we boarded the plane, they, they said she couldn't go. The guy from the government looked at it and says, this is no good. So you can't leave. So uh, at that point in time, it became sort of a, a decision as to whether we were going to go or not. She asked me and asked uh, Bobby, you know, my brother, he said, what you, uh, we're the younger ones. He said, what do you want to do? You want to go or you want to stay? And you know, I wanted to go. I mean, get on a plane. So that's when I said, no, I want to, you know, I want to go with me. With my, my, I want to ride the, the plane. So it's it like an adventure to me. <laughs> the man told me, you can go tomorrow if you go to that place and fix the mistake. What are you going to do? You are, going, are you going to send your children? Yes. They can go? Yeah, they go. My grandmother had to make a split-second decision because she wasn't allowed to call my grandfather. She so the children stay or they go on their own, but she was not able to go. I've always been in awe of that moment for her that she could do that. When they was walking to reach the fry, my husband and all my family was in the terrace looking, and they see them by themselves. They don't see me. And my husband and uncle say, where is your mother? No, she, she can't come. They don't let her come. And they go in the airplane. a friend of mine and tell her what happened. And then she, she told me that she go to the airport in, in Miami and take my four children to her house until I go there next day. The flight, uh, which is only, I think, 45 minutes or something like that. I mean, you're, you don't get to think much about the flight because you you leave Cuba and you're, and you're landing in Miami shortly afterwards. So. They gave us uh, gum on the plane, which we hadn't seen gun, gun, gum in Cuba for about probably two years, bubble gum. And uh, they gave us like, I think, I think they gave us like a ham sandwich. And I, I, we hadn't seen ham in a long time either. And I, we, were, we were excited. So the children, I would imagine, was like, OK, um, mom's not coming, but we'll see her soon. And soon to a child, you know, doesn't really have any concrete meaning. It's just soon. It was okay. I mean, at that moment, it was okay for me. But, uh, but look, looking back, that was, I think, the, the really the the moment that really I think changed my life. You know, being being without her. Next day, we went to the place, and the man said, "I don't know why they they say you that because everything is right." Well. I can't go today? No. You can't go today. You, you need to, you need that we send you telegram again. Could be a month, six months, or a year. We were well received and well, we're well cared for for a few days uh, till, you know, they had to kind of give us up to the welfare system. Operation Pedro Pan was the Catholic Church and the U.S. government's extraordinary exodus of 14 and a half thousand unaccompanied Cuban children. Between 1960 and 1962, kids as young as five arrived at Miami Airport 
and were taken to special camps nearby. These are copies of the airport logs. They arrived on uh, May 23rd of 1962. Álvarez Portilla Maria, Gerardo Jose, and Orlando and their uh, birth dates. It's important to realize that these were commercial flights. There were no Pedro Bank flights. You had two flights per day going out of Cuba and everybody wanted to leave. So getting a seat on a, on a plane was uh, like uh, winning the lottery. We end up in Florida City. It was an Air Force base compound with many apartments. All the apartments were turned into living quarters for, for kids. We wanted to mark the camp as a very special place, not only for us, for, but for all the children that were in the camp. On that side of the street, all those were boys and girls' houses. This at night was a, a lot of activity because that's where we, it was like a park, because in Cuba we had central parks, and so this was our park here in, uh, in the United States, and that's why we had a name Pedro Pan Place because it was our place, our very special place. The place was fenced, so you couldn't get out, uh, the, the whole compound. We stayed in an apartment, and the room that we were, which was probably not more than 10 by 11, there were uh, bunk beds three three levels high. There were probably about 15, 15 people in the, living in that room. I think they, uh, in our apartment, uh, which was a three-bedroom apartment, there might have been 40 kids or something like that. So it was chaotic. But at night, when our heads hit the pillow, everybody started crying at the same time, and you could hear, you know, a choir of crying in the room because at that point we couldn't um, avoid but to think what is happening to our parents in Cuba. There were no cell phones or any way to communicate. Sometimes later would take two months, so there was no real-time information of what was happening in Cuba. At the time that I was there, there were maybe 3,000 kids in the in the in the in Florida City. They would stay there for a while, and then they would fly them out to different places around the United States. When her papers were not going to go through, when it was going to take some time, something more permanent had to be decided, and that's when they were shipped off to Colorado. The welfare called me to Cuba, and they told me if my children can go to Pueblo, Colorado, where they found they have a, a coast in there. And I told them, if you promise me, don't separate, I say, okay, and they send to Pueblo. They call us up in the morning and say, you're leaving. And there was a bus of about 30 people, 30 kids that were going to the same place that I was going uh, in Pueblo, Colorado, to the orphanage. Well, children were sent uh, to a Catholic archdiocese throughout the United States. Uh, uh, we're still researching the, the, the number, but we have like 48 states and over 100 cities where the children were were sent to. They've never been separated from their mom. Now they're in an airplane to Colorado, and you just get there, and it is what it is. Boys go to one side, girls go to the other, and just uh, a realization of, I'm all by myself. The children arrived at the Sacred Heart Orphanage in Pueblo, Colorado. It was a mix of Cuban refugees and troubled children from all over the country. When the children flew over her and her three brothers, the boys stayed together and the boys side of the orphanage while my mother was alone in the girl side and she experienced some unpleasantness there a lot because it was a home for, it was a orphanage for abused children. So she was going into an environment unknown in Colorado and she comes from an island. There's a pecking system almost like a, like a small prison, you know, uh, right off the first, first day I, I was in, I went to eat for breakfast and they were taking the food off my plate. So I confronted a kid, you know, that uh, the, at recess. I went to him, I didn't say anything at that moment, but I confronted him. And we got into a big, big fight. But there was nobody there to, to solve this. Well, this is a fight, and they would just let it, pretty much they would let it 
go to its normal conclusion. My mom very quickly, as an older child at 9 and 10 and 11, she was in the orphanage, she was assigned little ones to take care of. So that mothering came in and, I, I, and she would say, and that was her job. She had duties to do. She was she was uh, very good at ironing. So she had she ironed all the priestly robes and all the children's clothes. She had a little girl that was um, that was rescued out of an abusive situation, and that was her little girl that she took care of. And it was her baby. It was her child. So sort of an instant growing up. I'm no longer a child. There's no time for that. Now I'm I'm a motherly figure to this child, and I must help that child. That was my mother's heart. I must help. I must comfort. I must make this better. My youngest brother was seven, my, uh, I want to say Orlando, I want to say eight or nine, uh, in the, in the, yeah, very, and my sister was a year and a half older, so younger than me. you were looking after them and being oh, yeah, responsible yeah. for yeah. them and oh, yeah. Yeah. keeping them safe. We were, my brothers were there, and Jose, you know, I, uh, to me, he's my second dad. Jose was, was, he put, he put the pants of a father and, and he did a good job. Do you remember being aware of the sense of responsibility oh, of course. that you had for your of course. younger siblings? Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that was uh, that was always there, and uh, and it was always uh, uh, something that took a toll on my childhood. I'm sure because they're asking you questions that you. Right. And it was really the responsibility of, of uh, playing that role. Yeah. After months of agony, Angela finally received a telegram allowing her to travel to the United States. They left Cuba May 17, 1962. And they sent me the telegram for come to United States, August 8, 62. You can take with you anything. They, they don't let me bring a suitcase. Just my dress up. And no money. And no English. Hmm. When I go in, in the flight, a Pan-American flight to come over here to the United States, and the airplane go up, I was sitting in the window, and I looked down, and I saw Cuba there, and say, goodbye, Cuba. I don't know when I'm going to see you again, but I'm going to keep a good memory in my heart from you. And then, I, when I sit straight, I start to, to sing, <coughs> que linda es Cuba, and then I, I compose the song. These songs, in a way, were almost like a, a coping mechanism for, for, she lived this really dramatic life and she had to make decisions that no mother should ever have to make. Angela tries out some of her songs with Carlos's new arrangements on local friends and family. She's someone who ultimately is about celebrating life, no matter how difficult. So you're hearing these lyrics, and they're difficult, and she's just celebrating life underneath it all. song itself and the one she performs it, it really does um, show us who she is, how positive of a person she is, given everything she's been through. Mm -hmm. Angela arrives.
arrived in Miami, Florida with just the clothes on her back, but her children were 2,000 miles away in Colorado. I immediately, I went to see my friend who picked up them and talked with my children by phone because I don't have phone. I said, Mommy is here in the United States. We are going to see each very soon. I need to find a job. The welfare told me, Mrs. Alvarez, if you found a job in Miami, we promise you to bring the children to you because you need to sustain them. At that time, all Miami was full of Americans. They don't have Latin people there. You need to speak English to find a job. For me, it was very hard to find a job. And a friend of mine, he told me, I, I have a job for you, Angela. Are you crazy? I don't speak English. No, you don't need to speak English. It's to pick in tomato in the field. You don't need to speak English with the tomato. Don't pick the tomato and put it in the basket. They give me a, a big hat and then I, 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 I wash the tomato with my tear because it was very hard for me. And all the time when I pick up the tomato, I say, God, why you did that to me? <laughs> and I, I remember writing letters to her. Of course, she was in Miami and, and uh, Lord knows, working, uh, probably making 10 cents an hour or something like that. And, you know, we write her letters and, and, uh, and her letters sounded pretty normal coming back, you know. And my grandmother, it was just that spirit. She picked tomatoes. She was a waitress and didn't speak the language. She just did everything she had to do to get her children back. And I think the children knew that. Um, my mother knew that. My, my uncles knew that, that um, it wasn't for lack of love or abandonment or any of that. It was just the circumstances. And that sort of helps you persevere. It's not forever situation really tough situation to be in but it wasn't forever the first check that they pay me i went to the welfare and said look i have a job oh god for you miss angela that you have a job but you don't make enough money for support you for children here with you if we found a job for you in pueblo would you go over there yes and they sent me to pueblo Angela finally made it to Pueblo, Colorado, and was reunited with her children. This is me in the airport of Pueblo with my children. Look at them. He, he asked her, who is she? And then I said, I'm your mother. And then, uh, oh, okay. he forgot to speak Spanish. That's Bobby. Yeah, Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot to speak Spanish. By the time my mom came, <clears throat> I couldn't communicate with her. And uh, I, I didn't, when she came to, you know, I, I didn't recognize her who she was. I asked my, my sister, uh, who, who's her? I asked your mom, you know, and then I realized that you know, she was, uh, uh, it was her. But uh, it was a very touchy uh, moment there, but it turned out to be you know, the greatest moment in our lives. Somebody was there to, with a camera when my grandmother reunited with her children and just the rawness of that moment in my mother's face. So my, my uncles were together and I know that my the oldest, um, Jose, sort of took charge and sort of protected his brothers because that's always been who he is as the oldest. But my mom, you know, by herself on the on the girl's side and just the emotion of that picture of sort of this joy but then intense realization of breaking free of all that she lived and just feeling it you just couldn't feel it in the orphanage there was no time for that you just survive you just push through but seeing uh, seeing her mother and just feeling the rawness the hurt the pain of that moment that picture just is worth a thousand words too she was uh, very much hugging the young ones rather than me so you know i i was already 15 or whatever 16 so you know she her uh, her co concentration which it makes sense you know it was mostly with uh 
uh, Jerry and, uh, and Orlando. And it's really a gift from God that, that she was able to come to us. But this was no happy ending. The job that I found for me is clean a bank after the people left at, in the town of Pueblo. And then he take me every day at five and I be there for clean the, the bank. Still not earning enough money, Angela was only able to see her children at weekends. She soon became a mother figure to many of the other children in the orphanage who would join the visits at her tiny basement apartment. They keep my children in the place. And then every weekend, I bring my children to my apartment, Saturday and Sunday. And always I like to bring a Cuban boy and a Cuban girl. I cook for them. And then- Do you sing them songs? Yeah, and then I sing, we, we singing, and then we, everybody was happy because we see each is older. She played a huge role in our life. She was our mother in, in absentia because our parents were in Cuba. So that the weekends were, were looked forward to. Is that fun, affection? She always, fun and affection were always a song. In some of our Sunday videos,